Good morning. Let us stand together. And before we begin our time, if you could, scoot in to make seats available on the outside. So eliminate those seats in the middle, middles of the aisles to make room for people coming in. And then you can get the name of the person that you just sat next to that you weren't planning on sitting next to. So meet and greet each other in the name of Jesus this morning. Well, let's begin by hearing God call us to worship through his word in Psalm 28. I'll begin and then we can all respond. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. Now together. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Yes, amen. We don't sing because of what we feel. We sing because of what we know. And we may not feel like singing this morning, but we do because we know that we should. We may not feel like the Lord hears, but we know that he hears. We may not feel like the Lord is our strength and shield, but we know that he is. And so, and we know because his word has said so. So let what we know lead us to feel what we should feel as we sing to him this morning. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Lift your voice, shout for joy, enter his presence with thanks. Let salvation song be raised, for he is great. Our King of kings, from depths to heights, his praises ring. Come let us worship and bow down. It's a simple truth, but it is repeated again and again throughout the Bible that our God is God and we are his people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Be seated and welcome to this gathering of God's people at Desert Springs Church. If you are visiting with us, 
We are so glad that you are here. My name is Chase. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the church. And if you haven't met one of the pastors yet, we would love to introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit more about what we've got going on here as a family at Desert Springs. So we'll have some pastors up at the front after the service. You can uh, come up here or uh, you can go out to our Connection Center. It's right there in the back, out those doors right there. And you can meet one of our leaders and talk to them and get some questions answered about how you can get more connected in our church if you're looking for a church home or uh, how you can meet with somebody if, if you don't really know what's going on with this Jesus stuff and this gospel or how to read the Bible, we can connect you with somebody that can read the Bible with you and tell you more about this good news, this God that we have that has made us his people. Or if it is your preferred method of communication, you can always email us, info at dscabq.com. Well, church, let me remind you of a few things. Today, this Sunday, right after church, is our adoption picnic. So if you signed up for this, here's your reminder, it's today. So right after church today, it's at Bernardo Trails Park, which is not the park right across the street here. There's another park just up Vista Del Norte right there on the right. So um, hopefully uh, you got a chance to sign up for that. I think there was like 50 of you, but um, I'm sure we can handle more. They're just grilling stuff. So if you're interested now, you want to go check out the uh, adoption picnic. This is a time for you to learn more about our adoption ministry, how you can help families that are adopting, how we can help you if you are a family that wants to adopt. Um, But we love adoption here at this church, and we are grateful for Jordan Carnahan, who is our deacon over our adoption ministry. Hopefully he's not mad at me that I just invited a whole bunch of more of you to this without signing up, but um, whatever it takes to, to get some kids adopted, that's, that's what we're about. So uh, again, this is right after church at 12 p.m. at Bernardo Trails, right up the, the street there. Now also coming up on Saturday, September 24th, we've got our Saturday seminar on healthy leadership. So as we've said, we've got a special guest coming in. I'm really excited about Dr. Matthew Hall, coming. Uh, Partly I'm excited because Dr. Hall is just a tremendous leader. He's got many years of leadership experience. He's got a podcast about leadership. Uh, I think it's called Lead Forward that is really, really helpful. He interviews all kinds of leaders in the secular world and in Christian world. Um, But I'm excited about Dr. Hall coming because Dr. Hall used to be my pastor. Uh, He was actually one of my pastors and one of Alex Schroeder's pastors. And um, we both consider him still a mentor. It was actually Dr. Hall who told us that we should come work at Desert Springs Church. So if you like me and Alex, you're going to love Dr. Hall. He's, he's great. So uh, this, this seminar, we need you to sign up for it. Okay, so it's Saturday, September 24th, and it's going to be uh, three different sessions on healthy leadership. So the first session is going to be about how leadership matters to God. Okay, so what does God think about leadership? The next session is going to be the ingredients of healthy leadership and healthy organizations. And then lastly, avoiding the common traps of warped leadership. So many, many of you are leaders in your various vocations. Many of you are leaders in our own church. You're community group leaders. You are uh, deacons. You have just, God has given you influence in the lives of other people in our church. I would say that probably every one of you has some way that you are leading other people. So this really is for all of us to come to this. And even if you are not a leader with much authority, you certainly sit under other people with authority over you. And so this would even help you think about how you relate to them in that organization. So I really want to encourage you guys to come to this. This is going to be a great opportunity. Again, you're going to love Dr. Hall. We're excited that he's coming out for us. He'll also be preaching the Sunday after this on the the 25th. So make it a priority to come to that. Sign up. You can sign up on our website or you can sign up on our app. But if you have any more questions about that, you can go to Alex Schroeder. He is our minister for discipleship and all of these events and things like that. So uh, let's do this now. Let's pray, and we'll continue to worship our God. Yes, Lord, we do confess that uh, you are our God. You are the God that made heaven and earth, and you are the God that made us your people. But it wasn't because we did anything uh, good in ourselves, but it was because you chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And so, Lord, we thank you for making us your people. And we pray that this time this morning would be used for uh, reminding our hearts of the truth that you alone are God. And, Lord, that we would use this time to give you glory and the worship that you deserve. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand now and continue in prayer and confession. We'll begin our confession with a reading from Isaiah 53 and then we will confess together. I'll begin. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now together. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now let's say this confession together. Heavenly Father, we admit and confess that we have, like sheep, gone astray. We have turned to our own ways and have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. Have mercy on us for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now let us turn to our loving Savior, Shepherd, who came seeking and saving the lost sheep. The King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I'm nothing like if I am his, and he is mine forever. And he is mine forever. see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness who walk by faith and not by sight by 
by faith our fathers roam the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by god's own hand a place where peace and justice we will stand was called to go in the power of the spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall Thirty-four, eleven through 16. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, 
and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Let's pray. Father, as we gather together this morning, we come to you with our sin, our recurring, persistent sin. And before you, a perfectly holy God, we recognize that left to ourselves, we could never have fellowship with you. But we are not the only ones who come to you. Our Savior also comes, and he comes to you with his sacrifice, his one-time, final sacrifice offered on the cross for us. And through Jesus, we can have fellowship with you. 
You throw the doors wide open and invite us into the joy, acceptance, and love you've shared with your son and your spirit for eternity. May we welcome one another like that. Father, may we welcome one another like that. Give us eyes to see the sacrifice of Christ covering the sins of our church. And would we invite each other into our lives, into our homes, into our joys, into our suffering. Continue to grow that kind of gospel community here at Desert Springs. And in particular, this morning, we ask that this culture mark our community groups. Father, as our community groups meet and do life together, may they come to each other with their sin, with their shame, with their hurts. Don't let their fear of rejection make them settle for shallow relationships. Give our community groups unusual courage to be vulnerable. And as they come with humble honesty, may they receive a genuine, perhaps surprising, gospel welcome. Would our community groups throw their doors wide open to sinners, sufferers, and those who want deeper relationships? Would they delight in your grace in each other's lives? Would they accept each other because of the work of Christ and not their own works? And would they unconditionally love each other because you first unconditionally loved them? Thank you for the many community group leaders who have been so faithful and welcoming others as Christ has welcomed them. We praise you for your grace in their lives and how they've created spaces for biblical community. Thank you for our minister of discipleship, Alex Schroeder, and how you've so evidently gifted him to equip these CG leaders for the work of ministry. Would you continue to give Alex and our CG leaders joy and endurance in their roles? Would you give them wisdom and how to raise up more community group leaders? Father, our desire is to see more members leading community groups saturated in the gospel, more CGs that serve as springboards for deeper gospel fellowship across the body. That's our prayer. Would you take the CGs we have and the ones that you will give us, and would you make them catalysts for a compelling community at Desert Springs Church? A community centered on Jesus. A community that comes before you and each other with our sin and receives a welcome from you and each other because of our Savior. In your son's name. Amen. Let's stand and continue in prayer through song.
As we turn to your word, we pray that you would help us to see afresh that we by nature are wayward sheep, that we are in desperate need of a shepherd, and that our Savior Jesus is our perfect shepherd who laid his life down for the sheep. Would you shepherd us now, Lord Jesus, by your grace and for your glory? Amen. You could be seated. Well, we're in the book of Matthew today, the first book of the New Testament. We're doing a series through Matthew. We'll get to Genesis again here just in a few weeks, but we have some more time in Matthew. And last week in our study of Matthew, we saw that the good news is impossible to suppress. News spreads. People talk. We cannot help but speak the things which we have heard and seen, the apostles will later say in Acts 4. We said just briefly last week that we are here as a church, and we have come to put our trust in Jesus to follow him and to worship him because We've been told about him. Someone told us about him, who he is and what he's done and what it means for us. Well, our passage for this week picks up on that theme and takes it further. That theme of telling, of news spreading. Our passage begins by reiterating Jesus' mission, a mission we've seen demonstrated in recent weeks through Jesus' engagement with sinners and his care and concern and healing for the broken and needy. It reiterates Jesus' mission and summarizes it for us, but then it quickly turns to Jesus officially commissioning his disciples to represent him, to proclaim him, in a deliberate and overt mission that reflects him. And let me tell you the value, the significance, the impact of our passage right up front. It is remarkable that God has purposed long ago that the good news of Jesus would spread in this world through people. People, redeemed people, yes, but people, people like you and me, ordinary people, sinful people, diverse people, strange people, people with a past. Now, God could have written in the sky in permanent text the gospel news for all to see. God could have waited for an age like our own to reveal Jesus to the world and done so through a blockbuster movie that puts all others to shame. God could have waited for a time like our own when information technology is in almost everyone's pockets, even right now. And God could have sent the news of Jesus straight to everyone's inbox immediately. He could do any of these things and a billion other things that we can't even imagine. He could have sent angels whose voices are louder, whose movements are quicker, and who are more reliable and dependable than we are, who are more knowledgeable than we are. He could have made them his messengers of the good news like he did to the shepherds before Christ was born. He did that once, but that wasn't his ongoing plan, was it? Instead, he passed the baton to us, people, frail, infallible, though we are. He deputized us. He made us his ambassadors. He made us his emissaries, his heralds. He commissioned us. 
That commission can be traced back to passages like the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, where we find the great commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. But it goes back even further, not to a great commission, but a first commission that Jesus gave just the 12 apostles in Matthew 10. Our passage for today finishes off chapter 9, which again summarizes Jesus' mission and motives, but then takes us through half of chapter 10, where the 12 apostles are sent out by Jesus on a unique mission. Follow along if you have your Bibles open. Chapter 9 of Matthew, verse 35, as we pick up where we left off last week. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. We'll stop there for this week. Our passage shows us Jesus as both shepherd and sender. Those are the two primary points for our outline. Jesus as the shepherd and sender of his people. So first, Jesus is the compassionate shepherd. We see that in just the first couple of verses. But notice the second verse first, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It was Moses who was first concerned that God's people would be left like sheep without a shepherd after his death. That's in Numbers 27. The later prophets pick up on that idea, and they preach it in great detail. Really, God picks up the idea and preaches it through the prophets in great detail, preaching it primarily as a condemnation on the spiritual leaders of God's people in those days. Let me give you just a few examples of this. Jeremiah 50, verse 6, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, turning them away on the mountains. From mountain to hill they have gone, and they have forgotten their fold. Or Zechariah 10, verse 2. The people wander like sheep. They are afflicted 
for lack of a shepherd. But it's Ezekiel 34, which Will read for us earlier. That's the big one. That's the longest and the most scathing of them all. And actually, let me back up to where before Will started reading for us. This is Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 2. And I'll just read a sampling to get us to verse 11 where Will picked up. It says, Son of man, referring to Ezekiel the prophet, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, say to them, you do not feed the sheep. The weak you've not strengthened, the sick you've not healed, the injured you've not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you've not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding of the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. And it's there at verse 11 that a string of I will statements come from God himself. God himself will rescue his sheep. I will feed them. I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them. I will seek the lost and bring them back. So when Matthew tells us that Jesus had compassion on the crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd, he is alluding to those Old Testament texts. Though the prophecies were delivered hundreds of years before Jesus' ministry, the same thing was still happening in Jesus' day with the spiritual leaders of God's people. The spiritual leaders, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were bad shepherds to God's people. As Jesus puts it later in Matthew 23, they tie heavy burdens and lay them on the people's shoulders. The time foretold by Ezekiel of God displacing the bad shepherds by coming and shepherding the people himself, had arrived. It had arrived specifically with the God-man, Jesus. And Jesus' recent miracles in Matthew 9, which we saw last week, were proof of his shepherding care. Verses 35 and 36 function like a, a hinge from one section of Matthew, summarizing what came before and also launching us into new material. Now keep in mind that I'm kind of emphasizing here the shepherdless condition of God's people in these days. But let's not forget this reality that they were sheep. Sheep. Not cute little sheep. Not sheep like a stuffed animal your daughter might have on her bed, which doesn't do anything wrong and doesn't stink. Many of us didn't grow up around sheep, and we might not know that sheep, especially without a shepherd, they wander. They go astray. They won't find food on their own. They must be led to it. They are sitting ducks for any animal with sharp teeth. They are not only vulnerable, vulnerable, but they get themselves into danger left and right. It wasn't long ago that there was this meme going around the internet of a, a sheep that had wedged himself in a ditch that was smaller than his body. And so three quarters of the sheep was in the ditch and just the hind legs were out and a shepherd pulled the sheep out of the ditch. And the sheep took about five steps and then launched himself into the same ditch in the exact same position. Sheep are dumb and helpless. They go astray, and they're stubborn. And that's all of us. Isaiah 53, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. That's your spirit animal. Ask Drew Hodge what his spirit animal is, and he'll say, I'm a silverback gorilla. 
Spiritually speaking, he, like me, like you, is just a sheep. That's our spirit animal according to the Bible. But even here, rather than disgust or aggravation, Jesus has compassion. Compassion. That word literally means he feels it in the bowels. He felt it in his bowels when he looked on the crowd that was harassed and helpless. But what does it mean for Jesus to show compassion and to shepherd his people? What does it look like? Well, verse 35, preaching and healing. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. Remember from last week, there's one of those summaries just like that in chapter 4. This is a great summary of Jesus' earthly ministry. Preaching and teaching and healing. I don't, know, I don't know about you, though. When I read a passage like that, it gets me wondering, what's the relationship between preaching and healing in the ministry of Jesus? Is it simply like two wings on a plane and both are essential in the same amount, the same degree? Or, or is it that both are good and we're free to pick which one we like better and which one we're going to emphasize? Or is in the Bible even one primary and the other secondary, even though they're listed alongside each other in a summary passage like verse 35? I think it's that last one. After Studying God's word, pondering it, and learning from others, I would suggest that there is a priority to the preaching and teaching part of Jesus' ministry. Secondarily is his healing. That's not to minimize the healing. It's there. It's important. Certainly important for everyone who got healed. It's just to take serious that that one of the most fundamental purposes of the healings in the Bible was to validate, was to confirm, was to bear witness to what was said. In Acts 2, verse 22, Peter could preach of Jesus that he was a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. It's not that the mighty works and wonders and signs didn't do anything or weren't important. It's that they primarily attested to him. Hebrews 2 speaks of what we have heard now as Christians. The message that we have been taught, it says, was, quote, attested to us as God bore witness by signs and wonders and miracles. The miracles attested. They bore witness. They were signs. They were signs that Messiah had really come. That's why passages like Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 35, as we saw a week or two ago, are so important. They validate. This is the time. This is the one. The miracles were signs that God was beginning to overthrow the curse and overthrow Satan and overthrow death and disease with the coming of Jesus. But Jesus' preaching gives us the interpretation of the miracles. We know what they mean, what they signify, what they witness to by what is said. And without the words of Jesus, the miracles would just be temporary fixes. After all, they're not permanent fixes. Everyone who is healed still get sick. Even one who is raised will still eventually die. Without the words of Jesus, the miracles are just temporary and for a relative few people. Even though Jesus is healing almost everywhere he goes, you think of all the people on the planet at that time who had disease and they weren't healed. The vast majority weren't healed even while Jesus walked this earth. Without the words of Jesus, the miracles could just be seen as impressive magic tricks to onlookers. And that's why Jesus at times refused to do the miraculous. When the people demanded a sign, they said, they said show us something mighty. Jesus says, oh no, you don't get any sign. 
And the reason I belabored this point is that I don't want us to be tempted to think that where the real power is, even today, is in the miraculous. That Bible teaching and preaching is fine. I suppose we should do it. Some of it's better or worse than others. But generally, it's kind of boring. It feels a bit like a classroom. And if we could only get hold of the miraculous, then we'd really have something. I don't want you to think that. I also don't want any of us to be tempted to think that preaching and teaching is necessarily divorced from compassion and care and shepherding. I hear that from time to time. People ask if this or that pastor is, is he a pastor or just a preacher? Now, if he's just a preacher, then he's no pastor. But let's not think that preaching isn't pastoring. It is the most fundal, fundamental way, the most frequent, one, frequent way that I pastor you here. And so a pastor who reserves 15 to 20 hours a week to study God's word and pray, to prepare, to preach, isn't avoiding people. He's caring for people even while he's alone. You say, well, what email did you get last week? What, what, who said something? What, who do I need to beat up that you need to give this little speech right now? No, I didn't get an email last week. I, I am so thankful for this church. No one is, is trying to drag me out of my study, but instead encourages it and prays for it. I'm, I'm just thankful for it. Hmm. Jesus had compassion on them, so he taught them. He preached to them. And yes, he also did miracles to confirm that what he said was divine. Before we move on, now let's not forget that Jesus' compassion gets played out later in Matthew in this really important, essential way. It's only hinted at in our passage with a single word that Judas betrayed him. Betrayed him, verse four. Don't forget, that's what's coming. The cross and the resurrection. That's where this is going. But Jesus shows his compassion on letting himself be betrayed and arrested and strung up on a cross and crucified, dying in our place and raising victoriously on the third day. That's why he came. He says in Matthew 20, verse 28, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom, a payment for many. His life upon that cross was a payment for sin, for those who are imprisoned by sin. That's every one of us. He died in their place that they might go free. Not go free to ignore him, but go free to follow him. That's what it means to become a Christian. If you're fairly new to being around Christians and around the Bible, you might hear vocabulary that you're trying to keep straight, saved, redeemed, become a Christian, converted. What is all that? It's the same thing. Repenting, believing, trusting in Jesus, this is what it means to become a Christian. It's coming to acknowledge that what Jesus did on that cross and in his resurrection is your only hope, and you're putting all your eggs into that one basket, no other. That's what it means to become a Christian. That's what Jesus came to do and came to show us and wants us to believe. As he said in John 10, I am the good shepherd. I lay my life down for the sheep. So perhaps today for the first time you'd hear that and it would ring in your ears in a different way. The penny would drop in your thinking and in your heart and affections this morning and you would say, that's me. That must be me. He died for me. Oh Lord, may it be so. And may I receive the benefits of all that your death and resurrection would give me. 
Well, secondly, we see Jesus as the sovereign sender in the rest of our passage. He's the compassionate shepherd. He's also the sovereign sender. Notice that Jesus sends out the 12 apostles, chapter 10, verse 5. But he begins speaking of sending back in chapter 9, verse 37. All this goes together. It's all about him sending. He is the sovereign sender. And this too is part of him being a compassionate shepherd. How does he shepherd his people? Well, preaching, miracles, yes. But also by providing for them workers. There are three sub-points that will help us keep track of what takes place in the rest of the passage. There's first a call to pray, verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. What is the harvest? Well, you might be surprised to learn that usually in the Bible, this harvest language is used for the final judgment to come. You can just jot down these references and look them up later on your own. Joel 3, verse 13, or Revelation 14, 14 to 16. Two passages, Old Testament and New, which speak of reaping this, this harvest language for the final judgment to come in the end. But, get this, a careful reading of those passages which seem to emphasize judgment show us that it's not bad news alone, not judgment alone. Because the final judgment will be, yes, bad news for some, indeed. But it will be good news for others, the redeemed. And in Matthew 13, we'll get to that eventually, Jesus gives the parable of the wheat and the tares, representing saved and unsaved, Christian and non-Christian people in this world. And he ends it by saying, let both of these, wheat and tares, grow together until the harvest. That's the end. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, and bind them into bundles to be burned. That's judgment. But gather the wheat into my barn. That's heaven. In Matthew 9, verse 37, Jesus is saying that there is labor to be done now in view of the final harvest. The disciples of Christ aren't called to exercise final judgment now, though they will actually join Jesus in that exercise in the end. But now they are to be involved in that positive, hopeful side of harvesting. Jesus holds out an invitation, essentially. Laborers for the harvest. He issues a call. A call for us to pray for more laborers because the harvest is so great. Now, who is the Lord of the harvest in this quick analogy Jesus gives? Well, following John Chrysostom, I think it isn't just a reference to God in general, though God in general, you could say, is Lord of the harvest. But I think this is speaking specifically of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. He, I believe, is Lord of the harvest here, even though it comes from Jesus' own lips. He is the one, after all, who is gathering and harvesting and reaping in passages like Matthew 13 and Revelation 14. He specifically is the one who will send out labors in just a few short verses from here. Chapter 10, verse 5. He specifically is the one who at the end of Matthew, with all authority, sends his disciples into all the world to make disciples, to harvest. So Jesus is the Lord of the harvest, and he calls on us, his followers, to pray that he would send more laborers into the harvest. 
Now, if you struggle with the purpose of prayer, when God is sovereign over all things, then this is a passage that won't help you a bit. (laughs) Why would the Lord of the harvest, who is at this very moment actively sending out laborers into the harvest, just calling them to himself, summoning them to himself, As he's doing that, he's calling on those same followers to pray that he would send more laborers. Why doesn't he just send them if that's what he wants? Why doesn't he skip the middleman? Well, sometimes he does. In fact, often he does. And thankfully, his plan is not riding on our prayers. But he has decided to use our prayers. We don't get it. But he does. He doesn't need our prayers, but he purposes to involve us in our prayers. He somehow is glorified in us asking of things and him giving those things. Psalm 50. Call on me in the day of trouble, God says, and I will rescue you and you will glorify me. We ask, he gives, and then he gets the credit, as he should. And so we should pray. We should pray. We should pray more than we do. We should pray even when we don't get how it works or why he has instituted this in his plan. We should pray even when it feels like it doesn't do anything. And we should pray specifically for more laborers for the harvest, for more missionaries, for future pastors, for future and present seminary students, for those who are considering full-time vocational ministry, for future elders at our church, for future Sunday school teachers at this church. We should pray for those. We should pray for new members and pray for their service and involvement in this church. We should pray for the next generation, that God would raise up a whole sea of offspring from Desert Springs families that are productive laborers for the harvest. We should pray that some of us would be uniquely gifted in evangelism. And we should pray for the rest of us that we would just grow another centimeter this year and another inch next year in representing Jesus well in this world. Oh, and we should thank God, not just ask God, but we should thank God for how and when he's answered these kinds of prayers, for how he answered the prayers many years ago when we began praying for some missionaries to go to North Africa. And God raised up two families to do just that. Whereas we so many times have prayed for finding the right guy to come and fill this staff position, as as Chase was just talking about a bit ago, Alex and Caleb and Chase and others coming from Outside this church, we prayed for those positions to be filled and God has provided. We've prayed for more elders. And we need more, but we have more than we used to have. And that's, what a blessing. It's the answer to prayer. We should pray. And as we pray, we should be prepared to take up the harvest labor ourselves. In other words, we should be prepared to go, to leave home and go to foreign soil where the gospel is less prevalent that others might hear it. Perhaps as we pray for more laborers, we'll find ourselves desiring to make that our full-time vocation and capacity. We should realize for every one of us, whether in quote-unquote ministry or not. We're all in ministry. We should realize that every follower of Christ is already a laborer for the harvest. As we pray for laborers, we, we should see ourselves on the field. 
and as we labor for the harvest. Let's keep firmly in mind who is the Lord of the harvest? Not us. We're laborers, not lords. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul could say to the Corinthians, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Let's pray for that. Then there's this second subheading, which we can call a call to the 12. A call to the 12, verses 1 through 4 of Matthew 10. As these 12 disciples, later called 12 apostles in verse 2, are called to Jesus and now will be sent out by Jesus. The apostles were disciples. Disciples, disciple means follower. Apostles were followers of Jesus, of course. But not all followers of Jesus could be called apostles. Apostles means sent ones. And yes, every Christian is sent in a sense, like every Christian is a laborer in the harvest, true. But the apostles, the 12, were uniquely sent by Jesus to uniquely represent Jesus and to be the unique firsthand eyewitnesses to what he did on this earth and especially in his death and resurrection. That's why in Acts 1, when they were seeking to fill the shoes left by Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, they looked for one who had been with Jesus from the beginning and had witnessed the resurrection. That's what the 12 do uniquely. And these 12 uniquely would be specially used by God in the birth and the spread of the church as recorded in the book of Acts. That's why our Bibles have Acts as the Acts of the Apostles. It's one way to title it. These apostles would do things that only Jesus did. Jesus gave them authority, it says in our passage, over unclean spirits and to heal every disease and affliction. That doesn't mean God can't heal later past an apostolic age. It just means that they did this uniquely. I mean, there was a time when uh, Peter's handkerchief, or is it Paul's handkerchief, actually makes someone well. That's an unusual time. None of us have received some kind of healing along those lines, I suspect. Of course, many of them would also go on to write Scripture, like Matthew, writing Matthew. In short, they were foundational. That's the language of Ephesians 2.20. The household of God, it says, has been built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, with Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Praise God to stand on this side of the apostles with their apostolic writing in print right before us, most of us with multiple copies in our homes, and to stand on that foundation laid by them. Laid by them! A ragtag group at the beginning. Remember, who are these people? Fishermen. They are not experts. They are not elites. They are not religious scholars. They are people with, at least some of them, with unknown, unmentioned, unspectacular backgrounds or vocations. And then there's Matthew, a tax collector. And also Simon the Zealot, which reminds us that this was not just a ragtag group, but a diverse group. Very diverse. You have to understand the polar opposites of Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot in these days. Tax collector? Well, he's a conformist, a cooperator with Rome. He's a part of the Roman system through and through, even though he was born a Jew. The zealots? That doesn't just mean zealous people, like people who have too much coffee and try to get too much done. (laughs) This is capital Z zealot. This is a whole group. This is a a movement of insurrectionists against Rome, trying to throw off Roman tyranny by war. In the year 6 BC, they fought against the Romans. Something like 18 months they fought. It is the zealots 
who eventually in the year 68, 69, and culminating with A.D. 70, it is the zealots who lead that revolt against Rome that eventually leads to Rome's response of destroying the Jewish temple. So tax collectors and zealots, in today's terms, well, Republican and Democrat will not do it. It's not extreme enough for how different these two guys were. Think of instead an organizer of the raid on the Capitol on January 6th and a staffer in the Biden administration. Is that different enough for you? And if you need any proof that it is possible for people with diverse political views to be in the same church together under Jesus, will look no further than these two among the 12 and Jesus' choice of them. Oh, it doesn't mean they didn't have some things to shed, some things to fix. No doubt Simon had to lose some of his zeal. And no doubt Matthew had to walk away from his tax-collecting booth. But can you imagine the potential tension, if not animosity, as Jesus now assembles this group of 12 and one is a former tax collector and the other one is a former zealot. That's just the way Jesus works, isn't it? It's like the body of Christ. It's like Jew and Gentile, dogs and mailmen. I mean, just <laughs> polar opposites. They, in Jesus, he's uniting all things unto himself. The fact that there were 12 is also significant. Let me just say this quickly. That number 12 is significant because not coincidentally in the Old Testament there were 12 tribes. And now here Jesus appoints 12 apostles. And if we fast forward to the end of our Bibles in Revelation 21, John has a vision of the new heaven and the new earth and he sees gates with names of the 12 tribes of Israel on those gates. And he also sees foundation stones with the names of the 12 apostles written on them. These represent the whole people of God from Old Testament and New Testament. So with the 12 apostles Jesus appoints here, he is, he's, like, he's like regathering a new Israel. He is reconstituting the people of God. He is he's doing something new that's in continuity with the old, 12 and 12. But it's not the same. It's different. Well, that's the 12. And then lastly, in the rest of our passage, we have a call for what I would call a trial run. A trial run. These 12, verse 5 says... Jesus sent out. Jesus sends out the 12 on a short-term missions trip, maybe only a few weeks. As I said, it's not the great commission he gives here, but it is the first commission he gives here. It's a trial run. It's a unique mission. It is unique. It's unique to the apostles, unique to this point in time, unique to this specific mission. It's important that we keep that clear. Certainly not everything Jesus says here about the methods he gives them is applicable to modern day missions. In fact, it's very different from what Jesus later says. And it's certainly different than what we see in the book of Acts. So it's unique. But the unique mission here also has some resemblance, some similarities with our mission's work even today. And we can certainly draw some guarded parallels and encouragement from it. A clear example of what's unique to their mission is that first directive given in verse 5. Go nowhere among the Gentiles or Samaritans. Go only to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus told them to go to the Jews and not the Gentiles or Samaritans. And Matthew, of course, ends his gospel account with something very different. The Great Commission is go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So the scope of our mission isn't the scope of their mission. 
But still, even trying to put ourselves in their shoes back then, why did Jesus give this limited scope? Why say, not to the Gentiles or Samaritans, only now to the Jews? Well, as a people who'd already been given the Old Testament with all of its promises and prophecies and history, that was their book, that's their story, as those who have also been hopefully waiting and watching for the Messiah to come that was foretold of in the Old Testament. They they were watching for a, a king and a kingdom. That's what we see throughout Matthew. Well, news of the arrival of the king and the kingdom should probably go to them first. They were the ones who'd been given the promises first. They were the ones who should be watching at that very time. And even the Apostle Paul, after the Great Commission, can really say that he started his first mission going to the Jews first, then to the Greek, because of that principle. So it wouldn't just stay with the Jews. No, the plan all along is that it would go to God's people among the nations, a people made up from every tongue and tribe and kindred and nation. Or as Paul says in Ephesians 2, he is making a whole new man in place of the two, Jew and Gentile. But for this time, at this moment in time, it makes sense that Jesus says, go to the Jews and say, the kingdom of God is at hand. The king and the kingdom is here. The realm of God's reign is now breaking in to this place and time in an unprecedented way. The next directive Jesus gives to the the apostles is also rather unique regarding provisions that they take or don't take. Verse 9, acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts. Take no bag for your journey. He goes on to describe a bunch of stuff they shouldn't take. And again, that's unique. We actually hope that missionaries take all that they need when they go to the field. But but this is short term, and this is expressing the urgency of the mission, and this is also a unique opportunity for these apostles to trust God to provide miraculously. So he tells them to not charge for their ministry service. In verse 8, he says, you received without paying, so give without pay. It's the very nature of the gospel. You can't charge for it. You can't really hire a missionary. That's why we send missionaries. So, you received without paying in the gospel. Give without pay in the ministry of the gospel. And yet, know that God will provide for you through those who benefit from the gospel. I know that sounds like double talk, but that's what verse 10 says. For the laborer deserves his food. The Apostle Paul takes that phrase and uses it in 1 Timothy 5, 18, calling it Scripture even though it's not in the Old Testament. It's only here on the lips of Jesus. The Apostle Paul uses that phrase in support of members of a church providing for their pastors. It's like Galatians 6.6. 6. He says there, let the one who teaches receive all good things from those who receive the teaching. So when you give to this church, well, there are a lot of bills to be paid around here. One is a giant construction project worth millions of dollars. The other is just keeping the lights on. But another thing is paying the compensation, you could say, of pastors. Not, let's not call it salary. Let's call it support. Because it's not compensation in the sense that it's pay, like, hey, I, I did you a favor. I taught you last Sunday. <laughs> Give me a paycheck. No, th- this is what you have done in freeing me up from outside work is just that. Freeing me up from outside work to be able to give hours and hours to study and prayer and meeting with people like you throughout the week. And that's a, a biblical thing. That's, that, that's what happens when you, you, know, you drop some money in the offering box in the back or you commit to a routine giving online on our website. What, what you're doing is supporting the work of 
laborers in the harvest. It's a biblical thing. It's a good thing. The laborer deserves his food. In Matthew 10, here's what, it's, here's what it looks like. Verse 11, whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there till you depart. Who is worthy? Uh, don't think worthy like who is worthy to have your presence in their house. No, it's nothing like that. Worthy here means those who have received both the message and now the messenger. You say, how do you know it's that specific? Why does worthy mean that? Well, because verse 14, notice that. Those who are not worthy are those who will not receive you or listen to your words. It's the message and the messenger. But for those who receive the message and now welcome the messenger, well, it means that they now show hospitality. They now take care of them on their way. They feed them. They support them in their work. This is the stuff of 3 John. You will do well to send missionaries on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. You see now how I said that this section, it's unique to apostles for a unique mission. But this is really similar to a lot of stuff we do. This is really relevant to us making sure the G's when on furlough have a place to stay and a car to use. And just like the reminder that, well, just like the reminder that God will provide, we should also see a reminder that some will not receive the message or the messengers. So verse 14, if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. That language, shake off the dust, was referring to a Jewish tradition when Jews would return to their land from foreign soil, they would wipe off foreign dust from their sandals and shake it out of their clothes as if to say, your very dust is defiled and let it stay with you. It's not coming into our holy land. But Jesus is telling his disciples to do that very kind of imagery as they travel through Jewish land. Uh-oh. That's a massive statement about who and what is defiled now. It's not ethnicity. It's not geography. It has everything to do and only to do with what you've done in response to Jesus. So rejecting Jesus and his emissaries places you under greater judgment than Gentile lands. And so the last verse says, truly, I say to you, it'll be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Sodom and Gomorrah, that famously wicked town that God destroyed in Genesis 19. Here it says, those who reject Jesus as emissaries will deserve greater judgment than them. In many ways, that was unique to this specific audience because, well, they should know better. They had the word. They had the promises. They had the prophecies. They should have been looking. They now had apostolic representation and confirmation by the miraculous right in front of them. They should have known better. And that's why the judgment is so severe for them. And yet still today, isn't this a a sobering warning to those who would reject Christ and the message and the messengers. You sure you want to do that? Read verse 15 again and think about it some more. And then pray for God's help to believe the alternative. Isn't it an encouragement to us who represent him? God will sort all this out in the end. He can laugh at us now, and God will smile upon us later. We are the aroma of Christ in this world. 
To some, it is the smell of death, and to others, it is the, it is the aroma of life. And so I return to where we began with the value and the significance, the purpose of this passage in our Bibles. It's to remind us that God has chosen to use people. People, people like me, redeemed, but otherwise not special. Ragtag people, diverse people. What a privilege to be invited into his harvest. The harvest is plentiful, whether you're in it or not. Get in on it. Join in the labor. Pray for more laborers. And trust that the Lord of the harvest will reap a harvest in the end that no man can number from every tongue and tribe and kindred and nation. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you are the sovereign sender and you are the compassionate shepherd. And oh, how we need both of these. We pray we would live up to these realities. Live in light of these realities. You're, you're shepherding and you're sending more and more. And may some here today who have never come to come under your shepherding, may, maybe today would be the day that you, by your grace, would reel them in and they would hear the shepherd's voice and they would join us in this flock. We pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'm going to stand and respond. Jesus, the name high over all in hell or earth or sky angels and men be
Tis all our business here below to cry, to proclaim, behold the Lamb. That's our mission. We are now among his men and women. We are his disciples, and he has called us to go into the world and make disciples of anyone, everyone, anywhere, at any time. Let's hold nothing back. Let's give our all to it, church. And if you're not yet there, if you yet haven't come under the shepherding care and the sacrifice of Jesus on that cross, as Chase said earlier, we'd love to help you. We would love to visit with you today or sometime after today. Chase said there'll be pastors up front who are here to visit with you. If you've got a question about Jesus, about anything I said, about anything the Bible says, about anything that would stand in the way of you coming to Jesus today for salvation, let us know. Let us know. And church, let us go out with this after we visit with each other and enjoy some fellowship together. Now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good that you might do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And everyone said, amen. Amen. You're dismissed.